Okay, so thank you for coming. Today I'm gonna to talk about SOE reforms and the China state capitalism. So state capitalism is kind of a sexy uh, phrase nowadays. So in 2012, there is a special report by the Economist magazine talking about state capitalism. Okay. Now of course, you can imagine China is a kind of stereotype of so-called state capitalism. So state capitalism generally refers to an economy where the government plays a very important role, at the same time the rest of the economy you know, operates under, you know, a mar you know, by market principles. So, and this is important not only just because Chinese economy become more and more important. Remember, you know, last year in December, in, in PPP terms, China has already become the largest economy in the world. Okay, so given such big you know, economic size and the relative rapid growth in the past 35 years, there are a lot of discussions about China's economic growth. So there is comparison between state capitalism and the liberal capitalism. Liberal capitalism refers to you know, countries like the US and Europe where you know, government plays a much more limited role. And then the question is, after global financial crisis, so it looks like China's economy doing pretty well, while the Europe and you know, the United States seem in, in great trouble. So at that time, there are a lot of debate about whether state capitalism could be a better alternative growth model. So today, I'm going to mainly talk about state owned enterprises. Uh, in fact, you know, um, this is not just about just a, like a Chinese economy issue. Uh, so state owned enterprise in China is actually a global issue. So this is a report uh, prepared by the US Congress. So they try to analyze what's the key features about Chinese state capitalism, and they focus on state-owned enterprises. That's also going to be my focus today. So what is the phenomena? This is a key motivating graph. Let me explain it. So this red solid curve, that is a profit margin of SOEs. Okay? And, and this uh, blue one, that is a profit margin of non-SOEs, okay? say pri POEs loosely speaking. What you can see from this graph is that you know, before 2000, okay, the red line is below the blue line. That is profitability of SOEs below uh, that of non-SOEs. So that is consistent with our observation. In the 1990s, nobody, if you ask a college graduate in mainland China, where do you want to work with, work in? Nobody say, I want to work in SOEs. But things are different. Now, if after 2000, especially if we look at you know, what happened before 2008, 2009 financial crisis, okay, you see that the red solid line is above the blue line. That is, the profitability of SOEs exceeded that of non-SOEs. So, in other words, SOEs are rich now. Okay, this is a list of global Fortune Global 500 firms. In 2011, there were 57 Chinese firms on that global 500 list. Okay. So China's only next to the US. And among the 57 Chinese firms, 53 of them are state-owned enterprises, 93%. Okay. So, and you know, if we look at what kind of industries are those largest and richest SOEs located in, most of these firms are located in what I call upstream industries, in energies, financial services, which you know, telecommunications that provide key intermediate inputs and services. Okay, so these are the industries that they are located in. So today, the key message I will try to deliver is the following. So what's the key question I'm trying to address is this. So why the state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, become more profitable than non-SOEs in the last 10 years, while the opposite was true in the 1990s? People might think about monopoly. But remember, monopoly just didn't start only 10 years ago. You might think about subsidy. Subsidy didn't just start 10 years ago. So what makes, what drive this you know, reverse of fortune of SOEs in the last 20 years? Okay, although the GDP growth rate is stably high during the whole period. So this is a question we try to address. So in order to address the question, let me highlight three features we think important in explaining this phenomena. So the first feature is what we call vertical structure. Namely, you know, if we look at industries 
in the upstream industries and downstream industries. Okay, so upstream industries basically, as I mentioned, like energy and you know, financial services, telecommunication, these are, provide key intermediate inputs or services. These are upstream industries. So after the economic reform, SOE reform in the late 1990s, what we see today is that the upstream industries are still largely dominated by state-owned enterprises. Okay? But the downstream industries, downstream industries refer, mainly refer to those industries that you know, produce consumption goods or services, you know, like, like food, you know, restaurants, hotels, consumption type service, or, you know, or, or manufacturing goods. These are largely liberalized. So the downstream sector in China you know, allow for free competition, okay, free entry by both domestic private firms and foreign investor firms. So in other words, upstream, if you look at China's economic, economic structure, the upstream monopolized by the state. Downstream, capitalism. So that's why we call it state capitalism. Okay. And we think this in, a, a vertical structure feature is very important. But somehow, it is not you know, explicitly uh, mentioned in the previous economic literature, at least. So I want to highlight this feature. And the second important feature about Chinese economy is that China is a large economy, meaning that it has abundant labor. Okay. So Professor Albert Park is going to talk about China's labor market in detail. So, so here, this also plays a very important role in our story. And China is also in the process of structural change. So structural change refers to the composition shift of the economy from agriculture into manufacturing and into service. So in China, it's main, we mainly talk about industrialization. So people move from agriculture into the manufacturing, into the industry. This process we call structural change. So this is going to also play a very important role in our story, in our mechanism. And a third element, third key feature of China is trade liberalization. Not, not surprising to us. Okay. China became the member of World Trade Organization in December 2001. And I believe that everyone in this room knows that in China, okay, China's government really encouraged export, so adopted export promoted policies. Okay. Um, so this so the fact that China is you know, quite engaged with international global international trade and glo trade globalization, this is also very important. So what I'm, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to propose an explanation that try to combine all these three elements, okay, and explain and to address the question, okay, why China's state owned enterprise becomes so rich today. So here is our key story. So this is a key slide of my talk. So our story is the following. Okay. After the SOE reform in the late 1990s, what happened, you know, then you know, what come out of it is that there is a vertical structure. So SOEs monopolized upstream industries, and downstream industries are dominated by private firms. So the downstream private firms, they take advantage of China's cheaper labor, okay, and also take advantage of the global market so the downstream private sector expand rapidly. Okay. So they export a lot to the world and you know, develop labor-intensive industries. So the downstream private sector expansion, that is a key engine for China's high growth. But as a consequence of the growth of a downstream private sector, clearly they need more intermediate inputs and services because they have to increase the production scale. Okay. So they need more financial services. They need more telecommunication services. They need more electricity. They need more you know, natural resources. But remember, all these key intermediate inputs and services are monopolized by upstream SOEs. So, the, so therefore, the more developed the downstream private firms are, then you know, the upstream SOEs can sell more you know, of those key intermediate inputs and services to the downstream at a markup price because they have a monopoly power. So in other words, upstream SOEs can extract more monopoly rents from the downstream private sector in this process of industrialization and globalization. So this is our key story. So this, so a question, you know, so our answer to the question in the last, what, you know, the question rate is here, why SOE become so profitable because they are able to extract monopoly rents. 
they are the consequence of growth, not to the contributing fact of China's growth. So you know, today people talk about SOE reforms, and many defenders for SOE say, look, we are already very rich. We are national heroes. We're on the global 500 list. We pay a lot of taxes. We really contribute to China's high growth. Why we still need to reform? We're doing better than private firms. Okay. But we try to argue, wait a minute. So, so we agree that you know, SOEs indeed improve their governance, et cetera. But we believe that and the most important reason is that SOEs can extract monopoly rents, benefit from the downstream you know, expansion of private firms. In, that, in other words, the upstream SOEs benefit from trade liberalization. Although SOE, if you look at the productivity, is still lower than private firms. Um, so, oh, okay. So this is a let's do a kind of international comparison. Let's look at the global five hundred firms. Compare three countries: China, U.S., and France. You see that you know all those largest firms for these three countries. China, ninety-three percent of this these largest firms are SOEs. Okay. U.S. only 3%. France, 11%. Remember, France is widely regarded as, as a capitalist country who has a very, rather large share of the state sector. But even for France, only 11% of those firms are SOEs. This is the first feature I mentioned. So this is really something like with Chinese characteristics. Okay. And the second feature is that if you look at industries, okay, what kind of industries are, are most you know, are those large firms in? When you think about U.S., you want to think of what has the kind of richest or largest uh, company. You might think about Apple. You might think about Facebook. You might think about Walmart. Remember, these are all in the downstream sector. Okay, but how about China? You think Sinopec. You think about you know these large banks. So they are very different in very different industries. In China, a large, almost 50% of those large firms in the upstream industries. So this is a decomp further decomposition analysis. Suppose when we decompose, we divide those firms into four categories, upstream, SOEs, downstream, SOEs, okay, and upstream, non-SOEs, downstream, non-SOEs. So from this graph, you can clearly see the conditional on the same ownership, say SOEs, upstream is still more profitable than downstream. So today, there are still some downstream SOEs. For example, t you know, tobacco companies or you know, alcohol. So these are uh, still in the downstream. But most of the SOEs, remaining SOEs in upstream. So let's look at this vertical structure feature. Okay. So this red line, that is the SOE shear, the value added shear in upstream industries. Okay. And this green one is the SOE shears in the downstream industries. I clearly see that in, a, in upstream industries, it's mainly dominated by SOEs. But the downstream, uh, mainly dominated by private firms. So this is a vertical structure. When we say vertical structure, we mean ownership distribution structure. The upstream is mainly dominated. So it is state sector, downstream uh, capitalism. So now let's think about this logic. So this is a story, key math one. I want to explain. So now let's think about logic. Why vertical structure is important? Vertical structure means that SOEs and non-SOEs actually are no longer competing in the same industry. They are separated. Okay. So it, without a vertical structure, the story cannot hold. So remember, in the 1990s, you know, the SOE reforms. At that time, the, basically, the reform is that SOEs are retreated from the downstream sector. Okay. So. When SOE and non-SOE are competing in the same industries, like what happened in the late 1990s in the downstream sector, at that time they are enemies. Okay, so they, when an expansion of the private sector, you know, if it, private firms' productivity increases, that will hurt SOEs. So that explains why in the 1990s SOE performance was, was bad, because they were competing with private firms in the same industries. And the trade liberalization clearly hurt those SOEs in the tradable sectors. So SOEs are losers. Okay. But in the last 10 years, you know, once the vertical structure come into being, SOE retreated from downstream, but they continue to dominate upstream, then it becomes opposite. So the SOE become beneficiary of trade liberalization and the productive increase of private firms rather than victims. 
because of the vertical structure. So why abundant labor is important? If China were a small economy, it cannot and so it cannot make such outside profit. Why? Because if a small economy, if a small population, then the labor cost is going to increase very fast. Now, once the labor cost increases very fast, that will hurt you know, the, the international competitiveness of the downstream private firms. It cannot sell so much because the goods are going to be, become more and more expensive. And then you know, the downstream private sector cannot expand that much, and hence their demand for upstream intermediate goods and services will not be that big. So upstream so you cannot extract more monopoly rents. So China is a large country that plays some role. And the structural change is certainly important. So China is in, in the process of industrialization. If China remains an agrarian economy without a structural change, then you know, the, the agriculture production, it would not induce that big demand for upstream intermediate goods services. Okay? So only when China is engaged in this you know, dynamic process of industrialization, then the more downstream manufacturing sector really expand. They, they need more inter, you know, upstream goods and services. So structural change helps to explain why demand for upstream intermediate goods, including intermediate services like financial services, become uh, you know, more and more important. So this structural change is important. And of course, trade openness plays an important role as well. Let's do the thought experiment. Suppose China were a closed economy. What's going to happen? If China is a closed economy, then the demand for the downstream private sector is only domestic demand. There is no international demand. So if, without trade liberalization, the downstream private sector would not expand as much as, as compared with the situation today, where China you know, is actively engaged in international trade. So in a closed economy, the downstream private sector would not expand that much, and therefore they do not need that much amount of you know, upstream intermediate goods and services. So that will also imply that upstream SOEs would not be able to sell, sell so much, you know, such a large amount of intermediate goods and services to the downstream if China would close the economy. Okay. So this is a key kind of a logic why all these elements are important in explaining China's outside profits. Now the question, so the welfare implications are very clear. So the high profitability SOEs, we argue, is mainly the consequence of China growth, not a contributing factor of China growth, as some people claim. In other words, you have to reform it. Okay. So it is a symptom. It is, it is a symptom of the incompleteness of market-oriented reforms. You reform the downstream, liberalize downstream, but upstream still hasn't been reformed yet. So this is because of this incompleteness of reform, SOE basically can arbitrage. So the so we, we, sh we show that if we eliminate the upstream SOE monopoly, that would be enhanced the social welfare. Because then, you know, the upstream so can no longer monopolize, so the productivity of upstream firms will increase, they'll lower, lower the consumption prices, that will be good for consumers, that also, you know, will make a demand for the for the downstream you know, manufacturing sector even larger, because now the upstream intermediate goods become cheaper. So that will facilitate industrial you know, industrialization. That will be good for the public. And also, that will improve income distribution. Because you know, this clearly has income redistributive effects. Those who benefit from SOE profits are only you know, a small group of people. Okay? Um, and and, and you know, we, we hope that you know, income distribution could be improved. So the question. Next question, very natural. Is this kind of growth sustainable or not if we keep this feature, if we keep the monopoly of SOEs? So short answer is no. Let me show you the logic. Why? Because if China has sufficient industrialization, so more and more labor is going to be um, absorbed away from agriculture sector, which has used to have a lot of you know, redundant labor, if you like. Okay, so the, the wage is going to go up. And in fact, the wage is already increasing pretty fast. In the, in the past 10 years. I think Albert is going to talk about that in detail. So labor costs are going to go up, and China's exchange rate also appreciate. That makes China's downstream private firms facing tougher and tougher international you know, business environment because now the costs go up. So if, if that happens, that will hurt, clearly hurt the international competitiveness of downstream private firms. Because in the past, 
although the private downstream private firms, they have to pay very relatively high financial cost and for the key intermediate input services because they have to pay the market price. But since the labor cost is cheap, so the aggregate you know, total cost is still cheap. So the Chinese downstream private firms are still competitive in the international market. But now the labor cost increases. Eventually, how can the Chinese downstream private firms compete with the Vietnam firm? Given the Vietnam firm maybe have a lower per labor cost. So in other words, an you know, downstream firm eventually going to be strangled by the upstream monopoly. Okay, if upstream so you keep you know uh, monopolize and without you know, increased productivity. So in order to, if the downstream private sector sort of die because it cannot grow, then upstream firms also going to hurt. Can no longer milk from the downstream. Okay, so that will be bad news for the upstream as well. That's why upstream is compelled to reform it. Okay, so first upstream, so you have to reduce the markup and eventually have to increase the productivity, lower the intermediate puts, price of intermediate inputs and services, so that downstream private firms can you know, revive and it can, can be competitive in the international market. So the upstream, and so you have to reform, even for the elite and the self-interest, they need to reform it. Okay, so uh, otherwise China gonna afford intermediate income China. Now due to time constraint, I, I don't think I have enough time to talk about how to reform, but the short answer is that I do not believe in a one size for all kind of recipe. We have to think about reform SOEs sector by sector, depending on whether it's a strategic sector or whether, you know, um, and also, and whether it is related to national security, et cetera. Okay, and SOE reform is not an isolated one reform. It has to be complemented by other reforms. And I believe in gradual, gradualism ra rather than a radical reform. So let me just stop here and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.